Hurricane Dorian will live long in the collective memory as the storm that defied all expectations. The storm that made one of the strongest landfalls in the Atlantic Basin on the first day of September 2019. Tied only with the Labor Day hurricane of 1935 for its landfall intensity with 185 mph per hour winds, Dorian then did the unthinkable and stalled over Grand Bahama still as a Category 5 hurricane. Two weeks later, the total cost of the storm is still out of focus, the scope of the tragedy on the northernmost islands, to many of us still stretching the limits of imagination. But how well did Force 13 cover this remarkable storm? Well, now let's take a look back together to see just exactly how we did that through many days and nights of live, uninterrupted at times, and very extensive coverage. The first mention of what would be Hurricane Dorian occurred on a tropical weather bulletin on August the 24th. At this point, it had just been designated Invest 99L. Out in the open Atlantic today. So far, 46 storms have formed around the world, and on day 85 of the Atlantic hurricane season, we have Chantal, 98L and 99L in various parts of the Atlantic. Uh, this is the North Atlantic though, uh, looking at the three features here on the screen, 99L also has a medium chance of development that could become a tropical cyclone as it heads towards the Lesser Antilles, uh, so we should be watching out for that one too. Later that day, it became Tropical Depression 5. Latest on Tropical Depression 05L, which has formed today in the Atlantic Ocean over the main development region. As of 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10.4 degrees north, 48.5 degrees west. Uh, maximum sustained winds of 35 miles an hour with a minimum pressure of 1,010 millibars. I mean, I wasn't really expecting too much from the storm. We were thinking maybe it could reach Category 1 status by the time that update was being recorded. Uh, most models killed it off in the Eastern Caribbean, and the NHC didn't have it becoming a hurricane. You know, I thought it was just a good idea to get some information out there about something. And by the end of the day, it got another upgrade to Tropical Storm Dorian. Evo in the Eastern Pacific, Dorian in the Atlantic, and Bailu moving inland over China. It's August 25th, day 237 of the year. 47 storms have formed so far this year around the world. Tropical Storm Dorian has formed in the last few hours now with winds of 40 miles per hour and a pressure of 1,008 millibars. Uh, it could be a hurricane threat for the Caribbean region. 697 miles from Barbados right now, 10.7 north, 49.5 degrees west. As we follow Dorian's track expectations over the next few days, uh, we think it will pass very close to Barbados and then move through somewhere near St. Lucia, Martinique, Dominica, and then off into the Eastern Caribbean where it could develop into a hurricane and further intensification up until landfall in the Dominican Republic. That might change the track. Well, when the storm first formed, I'm pretty sure in the late days of August, yeah, models weren't really too keen on that storm developing past Hispaniola, past Puerto Rico. So I originally thought that the storm was going to die. As tropical storm related watches and warnings started to come into effect, we also began using Spanish updates on the channel with Cesar Gámez. Son realmente 22, 23 kilómetros por hora aproximadamente. That night, we did our first live coverage dedicated to the storm in the form of a live tropical weather bulletin, which ran for an hour with the main feature being Dorian. Force 13's live streaming service. This is your live tropical weather bulletin for August 26th. The remnants of Evo, 98L, Dorian, developing in the Atlantic with winds of 50 miles per hour. For the minute, you're looking at those graphics, which are quite important. It is 344 miles from Barbados, Tropical Storm Dorian, that is. 50 mile an hour winds, and we'll be spending plenty of time discussing that tonight. I thought it was going to do what all of those storms typically do. 
storm was going to be a rather disorganized mess as it moved through the Lesser Antilles. It was going to get swallowed up by Hispaniola. And Dorian was going to go down as another disappointment. Expecting hurricane status south of Puerto Rico before making landfall in the Dominican Republic. There is a cone there, of course, and the center of the storm could pass anywhere within that cone. So that is something we ought to bear in mind when we're doing this forecast. There is still the outside chance that it might not make landfall on Hispaniola. Chance that Dorian hits Florida. Well, yes, there is, uh, but it is so far out that it would be irresponsible to give you any number of probability, a percentage or anything like that. Uh, it is a complete unknown where it will go after passing through the Caribbean. Dorian continued to gather pace on the morning of August 26th. Tropical Storm Dorian is slowly intensifying as it approaches Barbados this morning, now with winds of 60 miles per hour and a pressure around 1,004 millibars. It's currently at 12.3 north, 57.4 degrees west at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on August 26. These are what the models are saying right now. You can see here um, a lot of them actually going pretty low there, uh, but the National Hurricane Center, as you can see, by the 29th calling for a brief hurricane peak. Uh, there's a track map for Dorian right now, also breaking news. Puerto Rico are now under a tropical storm watch. As you can see there, it's outlined in yellow. There's the chances of tropical storm force winds over the next five days. Uh, those are starting to increase. The southeastern coast of the United States now. Florida percentage chances getting into around the 20% mark of tropical storm conditions. Um, when you're looking very long range, according to some models, they're calling for the storm to do a curve over Florida and then turn back towards the northeast. So that would be quite interesting. Um, but I've not seen... Well, the GFS Legacy, I think, is the only one that's calling for a Category 1 hurricane landfall in Florida. The main headline is Tropical Storm Dorian, which is uh, with winds of 60 miles per hour and a pressure of 1,002 millibars. At the present time, it's about 35 miles away from Barbados, maybe just a little bit more than that as it draws nearer, moving at about 14 miles an hour, 13.1 north, 58.9 degrees west. Over the next few days, it will of course cross over the Lesser Antilles tonight into tomorrow morning, and then it will move into the Eastern Caribbean, probably become a Category 1 hurricane, and then strike the eastern tip of the Dominican Republic before moving on over the Bahamas. The track beyond day three really is quite uncertain. The intensity is even more uncertain. It could end up heading towards Florida though as a strong tropical storm. Tropical storm Dorian has crossed into the Caribbean Sea this morning with winds of 50 miles per hour and a pressure of 1,007 millibars. These are the current watches and warnings then. A hurricane watch for Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic from Isla Sayona to Samana. Look at these models. Uh, you can see uh, the CTCX is out on a category 3 there the other models calling for high-end tropical storm in general wind shear is going to remain low it hasn't been preventing the storm it's going to be more the dry air that's been an issue um, but that is getting a little bit better over the next few days as well unless it goes further south like the HMON is predicting track forecast looks pretty solid though apart from that through the Bahamas along to the eastern coast of Florida. Tropical Storm Dorian continues into the eastern Caribbean and is passing the Lesser Antilles still. It's moved further north thanks to a relocation of its center. That relocation could prove to have been what made Dorian so strong. That's what changed everything really uh, is when it pretty much dissipated and reformed. Uh, once it ended up reforming its center uh, approximately, I think it was like 150 miles more to the north, that completely changed, it completely changed its trajectory too from moving nearly due west to basically north, northwest at that point. I was certainly, within my own mind, quite sure that Dorian wouldn't get to a particularly high intensity early on because um, precedence dictated to me that there was no chance or extremely low chance indeed we put it at 0.3% initially of reaching category 5 status 
uh, that it would indeed do that because no storm had ever formed in the Eastern Caribbean or traveled through the Eastern Caribbean and then became a Category 5 hurricane near the Bahamas. Obviously things change and as the storm progressed um, it became increasingly clear that well, no, not fully clear. Only towards the end did it become clear that, that was what was going to happen. Still hurricane watches out there right now, and it could become a hurricane before it strikes these areas, but it's unlikely at this stage. Then it will move off towards the Bahamas. Looks like it will track slightly north, and we expect it will become a hurricane on approach to Florida this weekend and possibly make landfall at that intensity. Still speculative, but that's our best indication so far. Tropical storm Dorian is gradually intensifying today. Recon has found winds of around 65 miles per hour and a pressure of one. 1,002 millibars, that's what we're going with at this hour at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this August 28th. Total rainfall you can see here uh, extending that large pink tongue which is the storm's track basically headed towards Florida. The pink area is denoting uh, three inches of rain or higher expected along that track and as you can see later on in the run as it gets nearer to Florida it really blows up in terms of its moisture content uh, and could deliver 10 inches or more to some of those coastal areas over the weekend into early next week that's a provisional early uh, estimate this is the GFS model there's the storm uh, the green area there that's tropical storm force winds starting to creep into some yellows now that's hurricane force and at the minute we're looking towards at least a category 2 uh, close pass or landfall to northern Florida and possibly states further north. Dorian then completed step 1 and became a hurricane over the US Virgin Islands has intensified throughout the day and has passed over the Virgin Islands just north of Puerto Rico as well it's now got winds of 80 miles per hour and a pressure we're estimating 996 millibars just one below what the National Hurricane Center is saying of course Dorian is the main feature tonight over the next five days it could become a major hurricane and strike the coast of Florida um, at the moment, we are seeing uh, percentage chances already uh, getting towards two-thirds for parts of the Florida coast for tropical storm conditions. The storm itself has a decent chance of reaching Category 3 status on some, some part of its journey. There's the track map right now. Uh, so, keeping an eye on this to see how it develops, because right now, if you were to extrapolate the National Hurricane Center forecast, you'd assume they have it going into the Gulf of yes. Mexico if we were to go 24 hours into the future in this shift further north than we were expecting it east. Initially, we were expecting a Hispaniola landfall. Now we've missed Puerto Rico completely. And we were also just yesterday expecting a much weaker system. Now we're seeing something uh, that could threaten Florida as a major hurricane instead. That was the part of the storm which really changed everything. And uh, once we realized it wasn't going to hit any of the major Caribbean islands, that's when we knew, you know, Really wasn't going to be much to stop this storm unless it got in its own way. But the lowest flight level pressure, at least from this pass, although uh, it could potentially be lower just because it doesn't look like it was the best center fix on this one, particularly just uh, looking at the wind speed through it, was 993.1 millibars. So it mm. pretty much enforces our uh, the prior last hour 996 millibar. Say hour 78 on the HWRF run, it is near the... I can see the capital that with the island that houses the capital, the Bahamas, and mm. the HWRF has it with a pressure of 932 millibars oh. and winds of 155 miles per hour. Oh, ah, and the, and the run is still generating, so we oh my it goodness. could go up to category wow. five, honestly. <laughs> now the National Hurricane Center wants it to be a category three at landfall. Now we want it to be that. Now it looks like it could be that. Now the HWRF, instead of saying that, wants the Category 5 storm at landfall. Five, and we're like, are you serious? Are we going to have to go through this again? A lot of that potential on how strong it actually gets will rely extremely on whether or not tonight into the end of tomorrow and the start of the weekend has a rapid uh, intensification trend rather than what we might be expecting right now is more of a stair step up in intensity. Well, let's just say right now see... it's had a very good start. It's very unlikely to pull... Oh, something like what Michael did, right? Um, <laughs> well, what did what do you mean by Michael exactly? As in, it, it'll strengthen to as it could strengthen to a potential category five all the way up to landfall. Um, I don't 
think that's going to happen. No. There is. Uh, oh dear, oh dear. Here's the radar image. Ah. What on earth happened? So it's that like dry air got in there. Yeah, that dry slot that was on the southeastern side has crept round now and has gotten all the way to the eye uh, via the northeastern side now. And oh dear, oh dear. Dorian's got a problem. He appears to be having a dry air invasion. Now getting to the actual forecast right now, most models do take this up to possibly a Category 2, Category 3. HWRF was a little bit more aggressive with a Category 5, but that's just a little outlandish for uh, this kind of storm of this magnitude this time of year. But Category 2 and 3 cannot be ruled out for this storm. It does look like it would make a landfall sometime late afternoon on Monday, maybe even early Tuesday morning before it starts moving up into the Georgia area. The next morning, August 29th, not much had changed. Overnight, but maybe beginning a new intensification phase this morning. At 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, August 29th, it had winds of 85 miles per hour and a pressure of 991 millibars. But I remember particularly a time when it was at Category 1 intensity after passing the, uh, the Lesser Antilles, moving out back over the Western Atlantic, when... Um, we're sort of, as a team, we're getting cold feet really, we're thinking, well, on our toes, what's what's actually happening with this? Is it going to intensify further? Satied was coming up with readings, getting up towards Category 2 status. Uh, the eye, I believe, was forming just fine underneath some significant cloud tops, which sort of disguised its intensification phase. The pressure was always falling, the first part of its intensification phase, and it was a really a gradual thing that kept going all the way through as it headed towards the Bahamas. This is Force 13 Live. We are tracking, once again, Hurricane Dorian for another night here at Force 13 HQ. We're giving it a wind estimate of 90 miles per hour, which is slightly higher than the National Hurricane Center's advisory that's just come out. They're still going with 85, a pressure of 986 millibars. Never before have the models been so sure of a Florida landfall on the East Coast so far out. Um, comparing with other storms that made landfall on the East Coast, such as Jean, Andrew, indeed, and Irma. Uh, the models are more confident with this one than they have been with any of those other ones, which really tells you something at four days out. As we've started to see creeping into that five-day forecast is the potential that it could slow down some more and that might be detrimental to its intensity, although it might not because the Gulf Stream is piping hot, 29 degrees Celsius or so, and so there's plenty of energy for the storm to tap into, and it could have the reverse effect in this part of the world, where the sea surface temperatures are warmer next to the coast, and it could spend more time intensifying rather than weakening. What I would say is, if the storm actually stalls, it doesn't matter how hot the sea surface temperatures are, if it stalls in the same place for about a day, the upwelling will really get to the storm, the sea surface temperatures will decline quite markedly, and then the storm will suffer. So if it did actually stall and stay in the same place for a whole day, somewhere out at sea, that would be good news. I don't think that's going to happen. Still, the timing could change from there as well, because as you can see, late on in that uh, National Hurricane Center forecast graphic, the storm slows down. Now, some of that might be uncertainty, or it might just be the fact that the storm actually is slowing down and stalling by that point in its track. And if that does happen, then the rainfall totals will skyrocket. The only real feature is Hurricane Dorian today. Winds were estimating of 90 miles per hour and a pressure of 986 millibars. There's its location, um, which is way towards the north of Federico now, 233 miles from Coburn Town on the Turks and Caicos Islands, 22.9 north, 67.9 degrees west. The storm is expected to travel towards the northwest and intensify over the course of Friday and possibly become a major hurricane before our depiction here on Saturday. And then by Sunday it moves through towards Florida where it will make landfall on Monday as a Category 4 is what we're expecting at the moment and that's what the National Hurricane Center is saying as well on their forecast right now. Still a lot could change with it and here is Dorian on the satellite imagery this evening. Hurricane Dorian is now a Category 2 storm on the Saffir-Simpson scale with 105 mile per hour winds, 
pressure of 975 millibars as of 11 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time this August 29th. See, most models do keep this as a Category 3. National Hurricane Center taking the Category 4 and H1 and H4 taking up the Category 5 there. Wind shear is not going to be an issue for it. Keep it about 10 to 15 knots. We'll drop to about 5 knots over the next day or two to allow just a little bit more time of intensification. And you can see the model guidance there, keeping it pretty much in the Florida h bond taking it down towards the Florida Keys. Hurricane Dorian has continued to intensify overnight and is now a high-end Category 2 hurricane with winds of 110 miles per hour and a pressure estimate of 972 millibars. This as of 9 a.m. Eastern Time this August the 30th, and more intensification is on the way. The CDPS looks at Port St. Lucie for a possible landfall on September the 3rd, with very strong winds of 130 miles per hour, um, a increasing storm size, but the rainfall is going to be the biggest threat, I should still think, with over, with over 20 inches of rain quite possible for the area. Now the landfall location... By the afternoon of August 30th, though, Dorian became a Category 3, major hurricane status. Hurricane Dorian is clearing out its eye this afternoon and is now a Category 3 major hurricane on the Sapphire Simpson scale with winds of 115 miles per hour and a pressure of 970 millibars according to the National Hurricane Center's last update. Looking at the GFS model you can see the uh, track forecast from that one. You can see they're passing just north of the northernmost Bahamas although some models and now the National Hurricane Center forecast takes the storm directly over those islands. The GFS slightly towards the north always has been uh, a bit of a north bias on this. Then hurricane warnings went into effect for the Bahamas and we began our 24-7 coverage on the storm. Andros Island which is still under a hurricane watch. The National Hurricane Center going with 115 miles per hour. We think it's a little low. We're actually going with 125 miles per hour at this time because the storm continues to improve on satellite appearance. Which it was kind of a surreal experience uh, when we decided to go for 24-7 live coverage and we just watched Dorian continue to intensify and intensify. It was kind of a crazy experience. Uh, I remember that I was saying it would be uh, maybe a minimal Category 5 uh, at most. And uh, while we were talking about that on the stream, some people were saying even that was a little outlandish. Looking even better than before. This is quite crazy. Again, still, you know, the cloud tops, they look very impressive on that image, but they aren't actually that impressive. Uh, barely touching minus 70 degrees Celsius in the cloud tops, which is generally um, not even that actually on the northwestern side which is generally only just enough to call a Category 4 if it wrapped around the whole eye, and it isn't. So we're still calling, you know, it still is clearly a Category 3 at this point, although the eye temperature is now up to plus 14 degrees Celsius. Now you hear these numbers keep getting banded around. The warmer those temperatures get in, inside the eye, the more intense the storm is. This is Force 13 Live. Uh, we have made a call at this hour, and we are now saying that Dorian now has winds of 130 miles per hour, which is Category 4 status, and a pressure of 961 millibars. This is from our satellite estimates at this time, pending recon data, which will arrive in the next few Minutes, hopefully, but probably hours. So this so, is a uh, drastic it, change to before. It is. It is showing that the storm does not seem to be trekking far west. You can see that the storm is basically going to be crawling at a standstill at three days, and after that, we've we've got very very poor. We've got very very poor accuracy after three days. Uh, and Dorian is obviously a very small storm. It's about the size of Hurricane Andrew right now, uh, so it's it's a very small storm. So uh, an eye wall replacement cycle in a storm like this can absolutely destroy uh, the structure of it. So, you know, an eye wall replacement cycle can knock down the storm's intensity by a good 10, 15 knots if it ends up not going well the western eye wall is starting to erode we're seeing the eye begin mm. to shrink we're, we're seeing clear banding i mean oh. um eye temperature is still minus it's uh, still plus 18 degrees celsius uh which is still a very warm eye but it is quite clearly 
quite a bit smaller than it used to be. Can't have much longer left. How I would have been very happy with a minus 18. However, the Western Eye Wall held firm, and by the next morning, August 31st, it was growing even stronger. Hurricane Dorian is still intensifying this morning, a Category 4 on the Sappho Simpson scale with winds of 145 miles per hour and a pressure of 943 millibars. It was uh, really draining, you know, uh, seeing the situation unfold and having to cover it constantly. I just, uh, it was less than two weeks after moving into my uh, new house for the first time uh, in 12 years. It's not really a house, it's a dorm, but it's the first time I've lived away from home this long ever. Uh, so having to do that in tangent with this was definitely stressful to say the least. Uh, but it meant providing coverage and keeping people informed, so I'd say it was totally worth it. The National Hurricane Center cone has shifted well to the east since yesterday. Still calling for a landfall on the Bahamas, the northernmost islands, could be an extremely powerful storm when it moves through there. And what we're also noting is that it's slowing down as it gets there as well, isn't it? Two days ago, every major model agreed on a Florida landfall four days out, which hadn't ever happened before. Never had the models been so sure. And now every major model is not calling for a Florida landfall. I still can't quite yeah, get crazy. over that myself. We were, um, of course it was, I think we were live that entire afternoon into the evening. Like, I think there were some times during that that I just, like, I got out, I just, like, went went to my bed and I just had to take like a an hour nap like it was it was really difficult just you know keeping up with the storm and just the I guess coverage we were doing I mean it was such a effort the eye temperature is certainly helping it along the way because the eye temperature is disproportionately warm compared to what we would usually expect although not quite as warm as it has been recently I think the latest temperature estimate now is 15 degrees Celsius. Yeah, but uh, I'd say that this general track here, or the general consensus of actual good models that is taking this, is um, more likely. Uh, I think that we're going to continue to see a gradual westward shift in the models with time as well. I was convinced at one point I last hour it was Nywa replacement cycle beginning. And now we don't know. We will find out with recon very soon. Uh, those planes can't go in there soon enough. I um, went to bed at about 8 p.m. Central Time on Saturday, August 31st, right? So at the time, Dorian was 150 miles per hour, and I think it was... I think people were saying, like, oh, it's trying to make a run for Category 5. I was thinking that... It would probably be a borderline case because those seem to happen all the time these days. So, yeah, I'm like thinking, okay, so probably approaching 155, might get to 160. Yeah, I, the satellite currently does not support Category 5. Uh, Raycon also has yet to provide any evidence of this storm being Category 5. Within minutes, all of that was about to change, with the first Category 5 recon readings happening just before the half-hour break. Please, please do, because I've got uh, some recon data here in, in Strep. Please don't go off on it. Okay, I will not. Oh. Is something interesting happening? We're going to take a short break now anyway, we're due to. Um, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes here uh, whilst we figure out what on earth is going on with this storm. Ooh, let's cross over to Devon with some news. Uh, they got flight level winds at 175 miles per hour, and it looks like the pressure has sunk beneath uh, 940 millibars. So it seems like with this recon pass here uh, through the radius of maximum winds, it does seem to support a Category 5 intensity at this time. Our satellite method of estimating the winds, we've just had our first Category 5 reading on that as well at 157 miles per hour. Uh, we're not going to make a decision officially as ourselves, Force 13, until the end of the hour, whether we're going to declare this a Category 5 or not. And then at 10pm Eastern Time, August 31st, we did. 
Force 13 has announced that Dorian is now a Category 5 with winds of 160 miles per hour and a pressure of 939 millibars. The big question that prevailed for that whole hour of coverage was, would the National Hurricane Center follow suit and declare Dorian a Category 5 at the end of that hour, as we all expected? We proceeded to make the call for Category 5. Um, and I went to bed right after that thinking, okay, this is peaking. Okay, uh, this is this is it. It'll probably start weakening very shortly as it heads towards the Bahamas. Uh, and one moment just before I left uh, on the live coverage that I really remember uh, is uh, when Devin said that we might be looking at a storm a lot stronger than 160 miles an hour. And that stuck with me. I wasn't really 100% sure what to think of that. Recon was saying it might be, but I wasn't sure if that was going to be the case. Uh, recon data has just come through, and I think we could say without a doubt that this thing is a Category 5 and is actually stronger than 160 miles an hour. At this point, we're just waiting for drop 20 to see what that pressure is. Uh, wind speed seems pretty undebatable to be at least uh, 165 miles per hour at this point is i think that is really the shocking thing that we're trying to process right now is that raycon just confirmed that the storm is literally 15 miles per hour than we thought it was yeah so so you think it's 165 devon the the recon i think absolutely no doubt showed 165 we have Multiple we had times. both of the planes go through there we have a 155 not sfmr three different 145 knot SFMRs. And we have a drop zone that says 155 knots. The moment yep. we're just in a sort of uh, unnerving quiet as we wait kind of a just few like moments. eerie silence almost, you know. And there is the update. It's, it's uh, just, no changes yeah, in the warnings and they are going with 150 miles per hour and a pressure of 940 millibars. What? What? Such a shocking revelation that I had to read it out twice. Yeah. Unless they've made an error, they have gone with 150 like miles per hour and a pressure of 940 millibars. That is a big shocker. That is shocking. Still too shocked, so I had to read it out three times. This time, 150 miles per hour at the update, 940 millibars from the National Hurricane Center. Thoughts from the team? Wow, I'm pretty Tula. surprised Tula. to see that. Tula. Doesn't make sense, to me at least, based on the data we've received from them. He said both they aircraft like measured peak. They flight. don't like it because the flight level winds doesn't match the reductions. There's 150 knot flight level winds in the system. You usually reduct that to be from a knot reading to a mile an hour reading and then turn that back. So there's a hundred and there's a hundred and fifty knot. There's a one hundred and fifty knot flight level reading that would be indicative of a category five. You guys go ahead and say that Hurricane Matthew gets a hundred and thirty five <laughs> knot flight level winds, and then you say that's a hundred and sixty five mile an hour, and you're saying this ain't a cat five? Are you kidding me? Oh, the thought process was pretty simple. The recon looked better than Hurricane Matthew, and they called it 165 miles an hour in postseason analysis, and they didn't believe that they had sufficient evidence to call Dory in a Category 5. I don't know what else to say about it. That really, that really just puts it right there for you. I mean, obviously, it ended up becoming undisputably a Category 5 moving on. Uh, getting all the way up to 185 miles an hour, having one of the most perfect structures I've ever seen an Atlantic hurricane ever have. However, at that time, it also looked to be a pretty cut and dry Category 5. And it just seems like they missed it. Things happen. And like I and like I ended up saying before, you know, they're the official agency. They are perfectly allowed to go ahead and set that precedence that they don't have enough evidence. But they got to be consistent about it. So if they're going to make that call, at least be consistent 
and make that call in the future or retroactively make those calls in the past. It was hilarious because there was several, several um, supports, estimate supports of 160 miles per hour for the storm. And they went with 150. But like Devin said, they went with off of, I believe, one or two readings of Cat 5 winds for Matthew. And they went with 165 miles per hour. So it's, it's, it's all just speculation at this point. But the NHC will probably upgrade it in their TCR at the late this year or early next year. By the next morning, the National Hurricane Center confirmed that this storm was now a Category 5 barreling towards the Bahamas. Hurricane Dorian is going to make a catastrophic pass to the Bahamas later today as a Category 5 with winds of 160 miles per hour and an estimated pressure of 927 millibars. Looks to me at this stage that we're going to see a landfall on those islands, uh, Greater Barco Island first of all, in about four or five hours, possibly less if, less if it jogs to the south. Three and a half hours later, it did make landfall, with winds of 185 miles per hour. Hurricane Dorian made a tremendous landfall on the Bahamas a few hours ago with winds of 185 miles per hour sustained and a pressure of 911 millibars, gusting with winds of 220 miles per hour. Next thing you know, I wake up to a 175 mile an hour Dorian and uh, it peaks at 185 miles an hour later that day and it was just a catastrophic situation. I can't even comprehend what it must have been like for the people in the Bahamas. I remember in 2018, during Hurricane Michael, I went to bed with 120 mile per hour winds in it, and I woke up to 140. And I went to bed with Dorian with 150, and I woke up to 180. And waking up to a 180 mile per hour storm completely shocked me. Because when the storm was bearing down on Category 5 intensity... I was thinking that it was maybe going to get to 160, maybe even 165, maybe even 175 tops. But 180 just blew my socks off. I was not expecting it at all. Got 14 hours of sleep that night, woke up at 10 a.m., and the first thing I see when I log into Discord is that I have 167 notifications. It was particularly Thomas. He was the one that was talking to me, and... He's like, I knew it! I knew Dorian was going to be a Cat 5! I'm like, oh dear, is it a Cat 5? And he's like, yeah! The NHC just went with 180 miles per hour. I'm like, what?! Storm surge of 23 feet, rainfall of up to 30 inches. Those islands are getting completely trashed at this time. Landfall occurred not so long ago, and with an expected slowdown of this storm over the next few hours and days, it could be lingering near Grand Bahama for two days. Uh, near this intensity as well, hopefully the storm does something we don't expect again for the better and weakens. But at the moment, we are looking at Category 5 conditions for quite some time yet. You can see that there's so there's so far no instances of an eyewall placement cycle, or no, no I, I, actually I should rephrase that, uh, no eyewall placement cycles to be seen here at all, really. There's some slight little moats here, but this radar site is quite uh, far away over far in away. Uh, Florida, so it could be just due to that, simply. But you could obviously clearly see the eyewall there, uh, impacting the Bahamas there as a 185 mile an hour beast. Catastrophic Category 5 Dorian beginning to cross eastern Grand Bahama. I can tell you the center of the storm's eye is just five miles offshore now and will probably make a full landfall on Grand Bahama in a few hours. Some people were talking about an eye wall replacement cycle. Is that actually happening? We've been discussing whether or not it's going to go into an eye wall replacement cycle every time we use this one minute imagery to find any flaw we think it's starting an eye wall replacement cycle maybe it's an issue just due to land interaction i know the islands of the bahamas are small but they are land and so it may cause some slight weakening there we were looking for very minute things about the storm uh radar was pulled up satellite was pulled up and while the storm was stalling we were really just looking for the little list of changes we were noticing the upwelling we were noticing every little aspect of the storm as it changed every single characteristic as the eye got larger and smaller 
as the eye wall replacement cycles were occurring. I mean, according to us with the center of the eye, do we have landfall at this point in time? Over Grand Bahama, I, I think so, yes. Because the very last frames looks like more than half the eye is there, and it looks like we, we finally have a landfall. And the first half of those Category 5 sustained winds are through <clears> the <throat> east, very eastern port of Grand Bahama. And at this rate, uh, Freeport is going to get the worst of it as well. But getting into the forecast, most everybody still has it as a Category 5 for the next 30 hours before it is forecasted to make a northward turn and start paralleling the United States coastline. Some areas along the coast could experience tropical storm force and hurricane force winds, and it's slated to be a major hurricane by the time it gets up to Wilmington before it finally does move out to sea and its historical run comes to an end for the Bahamas and the United States. The next morning, Dorian was still a Category 5 and had barely moved. Hurricane Dorian is still delivering Category 5 winds to Grand Bahama this morning with winds of 165 miles per hour and a pressure of 916 millibars. It's common for storms to stall and that's quite tragic when they do so, but for Dorian to do so as not only a Cat 5, but it's maintained that maintained major hurricane intensity for about 36 hours and that southern Iowa was just over Grand Bahama for who who knows how long. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Like I was, I remember on a Monday when it was like I was just like so. I had so much feelings for them. Like they were, I could not imagine. I just imagine it just being like total hell over there. We all knew it was coming. I I could tell you that we all knew it was coming and. I think we were pretty much all just begging for mercy at that point. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't just me. You know, I was working, <laughs> which is even which is even more scary when you think about it. I mean, I know it was it was starting to stall when I was at work, and I was like, you know, it just wasn't fun. And then the weekend ended up coming, and that was just that was just the longest weekend ever. I did not get a weekend there. It was really a scary thing. You don't see Category 5s. Category 5s stalling directly over a landmass. I'm I can't I can't really think of another time where that has even happened. Uh, wind shear has taken a higher rise than we expected today, which has contributed to the storm's weakening. Um, relative humidity has also been a little bit lower than expected today as well, with potential dry air intrusion being a factor in the storm's weakening process so far. Looking at it, it, it really hasn't moved. I mean, the past 36 hours, and potentially another 12 to 24 hours as well, if the storm doesn't start to move immediately, it's just an absolutely catastrophic circumstance for uh, Grand Bahama as well, just because the, the pressure readings have been quite erratic uh, so far with the drop zone data compared to so flight level. So basically everything is erratic right oh. now. <laughs> Everything's erratic. Yeah, it looks like, oh, it's stalled. Oh, it's starting to move north, but it actually pull away. Now it's doing a southwest jog with the eye actually starting to come back over land partially in parts of Grand Bahama. Uh, the, the vol And not just the, the, the eye temperature as well extremely volatile looks like in the latest uh, frames in the one minute chart that warmer area is getting bigger again the, the, the sheer volatility that we're seeing occur at such a constant rate is absurd we've been at a crossroads here for over 24 hours really <laughs> but yeah. this is literally the moment where it decides um whether the storm is moving towards the west towards florida to deliver hurricane conditions to the coast whether it's going to move further north or east and not affect the coast so heavily or and and whether the storm will intensify from here or weaken by 10 p.m. eastern time on the 2nd it still hadn't moved it's the storm that won't move hurricane dorian is refusing to budge this evening just off the northern coast of Grand Bahama. This is a six hour loop and all it has done is a loop around itself and now might be doing another one there on the latest imagery. Uh, 
it is mind-blowing how slowly this storm has moved over the course of well over 24 hours now. You can see that this jumps up, jumps down, jumps back up, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe even seven different peaks that you can see here from this curve. And that is, just shows you how disrupted the uh, structure of the storm actually and in you, the tropics. National Hurricane Center Cone. Uh, they are not expecting a landfall by the looks of things, but as you can see, it is very close to one on the North Carolina Outer Banks. Um, well, the National Hurricane Center Cone continues to shift ever so slightly further east, uh, especially the first part of it. Um, so, the still the center of the storm could pass anywhere within the cone. Hurricane Dorian remains an incredibly powerful category 3 storm at this time with winds of 120 miles per hour and a pressure of 952 millibars. It's been moving agonizingly slow for the best part of two days now. It made landfall, the first landfall in the Bahamas at 12.45 p.m. two days ago and we're now at 9 a.m. and the storm has barely moved 100 miles since. So it has been a catastrophic storm, uh, can never be overstated uh, how destructive it will have been for those northernmost islands of the Bahamas. But you can see still pretty strong convection on the northwestern side and you can see the eyes pretty well defined with an eye wall on the northern west and the western sides uh, and somewhat on the southern side uh, that looks to be the weakest one that we can see. Uh, just based on infrared satellite imagery that we've been able to see as well, we, we it's easy to presume that the eastern side is definitely the weakest by a good margin. Um, but that eye is potentially starting to clear out, and you can see these heavy bands of convection that are f uh, flourishing on the northwestern side of the system trying to wrap around. You can certainly see from the shape that the eye is coming back, and it's going to be quite a large one. Um, for instance, you know, the eye... Uh, could fit in the gap between Grand Bahama and Great Abaco Island. It, now, it was doing that earlier at its smaller size. Now the eye is about between two and three times the size of it what, as, a, as it was when it was moving through that area. Uh, I am relieved to see that Dorian continues to weaken faster than the NHC expected it and faster than I expected it to. Um, I hope that trend does continue, and it looks like the western side of things in particular has really started to take a nosedive when it comes to its um, structure recently. So what we're noticing in very recent frames is a significant gap in the southern eye, a real break there, and that may be another sign that the storm is weakening. Um, cloud tops are also dis disintegrating, really. As the storm went up towards the... Uh the coast of the United States, most of our team were completely exhausted by the whole experience and really towards the end of Dorian's coverage it was really just me and Tim and one or two others here and there who were putting in all of the uh, video updates on the channel. Um, I know that uh, Thomas did one very close to the end when it turned post-tropical um, and I actually thought that the storm would make landfall in South Carolina um, probably as a category two or three it came very close to doing so, not quite, thankfully. And then it drifted off, as we know, towards the northeast. The eye is still looking somewhat frail, uh, but there is more convection, renewed convection blowing up, particularly towards the southern side of the storm this morning. Um, but you can see a dry slot that's just moving roll around the eye in those latest frames, starts towards the south, ends up east, moves north. Uh, swirling around along with that convection as well so it looks like it's got an open eye at this point uh, but still it will probably hold intensity for another day at least. The latest run has shifted it further south so it's no longer depicting a landfall but very close to one on the North Carolina Outer Banks. National Hurricane Center are predicting a landfall in North Carolina for the first time um, on their last forecast advisory, but it's very fine margins. It's been looking better in the latest frames in terms of its eye wall and its cloud tops, although its eye temperature has been failing a little bit in the last few hours. But then... Here's your tropical weather bulletin. We're at peak season of the northern hemisphere and it shows. Storms everywhere at this point, 
Hurricane Dorian, we expect, is now at Category 3 status, according to satellite estimates and recon readings from earlier. So, uh, the main feature, of course, is Hurricane Dorian. We've got it back up to 115 miles per hour, pressure 956, according to latest indications. Um, it is still just off the coast of Florida, 106 miles from Brunswick, Georgia now, 30.9 north, 79.7 degrees west. This storm is likely to track towards the northeast and could affect the Carolinas with hurricane force winds. It should weaken before it gets to its closest point between places like Charleston and Wilmington. It will deliver a lot of rainfall, however, then it will scoot off towards the northeast. Shouldn't deliver too bad conditions to the northeast of the US, but could be a powerful storm by the time it strikes Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Uh, the storm has really developed in, in a pronounced eyewall here. You can see in the later frames, the eastern side seems to be eroding a little bit, but that could be because of the radar being far away, so its beam is not able to pick up the eastern side as much. Getting into the visual imagery, you can see where that northwestern eye wall has started to build back in. That has allowed it to re-intensify just a little bit back up to major hurricane threshold at 115 miles per hour. And you can really see that eye wall build back in on the water vapor imagery. A lot of those greens and reds starting to build back in over that northwestern side. It's not as strong as it was a few days ago, but still looks very impressive on the visual imagery. Which is why Recon, when they did go, they did find surface level winds that were indicative of it being upgraded back to category three. Looking down at the model spread, you can see they're generally expecting weakening very, very soon. So, and that will be terminal weakening finally with Dorian. So you'll notice a more pronounced northeasterly turn there at the last possible moment really before hurricane winds struck South Carolina. It was moving due north before that. But finally, we've seen a more pronounced northeasterly turn, so that's potentially some good news. And on the right hand side of our screen, we can see that the storm is still progressing towards the coast of South Carolina. Some signs of weakening exhibited in the imagery. And you can see the storm's progress. It is starting quite clearly to move northeast, and this is going to continue. It has been swirling around, doing little loops within that northeasterly heading. Um, it's been jogging towards the north and northwest a little bit. You can see it more in the infrared there. But overall, it has been a northeasterly turn. But at any jog to the north, could bring hurricane force winds ashore. The edge of Dorian's eye is passing over Cape Hatteras this morning as a category one high end with winds of 90 miles per hour and a pressure of 956 millibars as of 9 a.m. Eastern time this September 6th. Well, let's take a look at the latest satellite imagery. You can see how the storm is rapidly increasing in uh, speed, moving off towards the northeast. No more stalling for this storm. And as you can see, it has just been kissing the coast of the United States the whole time just about making a landfall on Cape Hatteras in those last frames. Um, so that is interesting, and that would be, if it is a landfall, that's the first United States landfall, remarkably. The storm ended up moving northward and hit uh, Canada as a cat, too. I mean, <laughs> the, that, I don't know if I really need to say any, much else about that. Storm moved north, hit Canada as a cat, too. Uh, last time I think that happened was Hurricane Juan. Uh, that just tells you how resilient the storm was. Hurricane Dorian has intensified to reach Category 2 status yet again. 100 mile an hour winds and a pressure of 953 millibars off the coast of Nova Scotia as of 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time this September 7th. The convection really fizzling out in the last few images there on this infrared imagery. Um, but the influence from the storm is massive at this point, extending all the way from Maine to the eastern tip of Newfoundland. The southern side intaking dry air, so it's very dry on that southern side, although winds are still going to be rather strong. The northeastern side is where it's at, and hurricane force winds are likely occurring along the coast of Nova Scotia at this time, and will also occur on parts of... Still with winds of 100 miles per hour, Dorian turned post-tropical, becoming the strongest post-tropical hurricane since Ellen of 1973. The center declared it has made landfall not so long ago. It has now moved just inland one mile from Ship Harbor, Nova Scotia, just a few miles northeast of Halifax, 44.8 north, 62.9 degrees west. Over the next few days, the storm will gradually weaken, could still deliver hurricane conditions to Newfoundland and Labrador, and will move back out over the Atlantic over the course of this week, pass to the south of Iceland, and then eventually wind up 
moving towards the Arctic regions through the North Sea. Force 13 produced its final update on Dorian on September the 9th. East northeast will affect Iceland, possibly with tropical storm force winds, as well as the Faroe Islands and northern parts of Scotland and Ireland, and will then move off into the Arctic regions, um, well towards the northwest of Scandinavia. Dorian's dead, but the ghost lives on. Um, we were just tired of it by that point, extremely tired of it as a team, as a community, I should imagine. The meteorological community was fed up and <laughs> there was jubilation, signs of jubilation scenes indeed, when Dorian actually died. And then it was still traceable, even after that, uh, moving across the Atlantic, got absorbed by another low pressure system and its remnants then got scattered across Greenland, Svalbard and even into parts of Russia. Over 50 fatalities have so far been declared in the Bahamas after Dorian's wrath. Many, including those who live in the impact zone, believe this number to be much too low. In some places on the northern islands, nothing was spared at all. Basic necessities are sparse, and it is believed that some areas still haven't been reached at all so far. You can directly help the relief efforts in the Bahamas by donating to the Bahamas Disaster Relief Fund in Nassau. It was a lot to watch at once, uh, but I think we did a good job of it on the air. It was definitely a stressful and tedious event, uh, but I'm glad that we did hold the event, and I truly do believe we saved lives um, while holding that life coverage. It was pretty solemn, uh, pretty negative disposition for me. Uh, you know, I was doing our best to provide coverage for people, but at the same time, seeing that unfold and knowing the calamity that was ongoing uh, was just devastating. You know, that's probably what took a toll on me more than uh, moving around or having to be on live stream a lot was the fact that, you know, lives were being upended. You know, we don't know that the true damage toll or the death toll yet, you know. I, th I think that... I almost want to call it the storm of the century for at least the Atlantic Basin. It's the strongest landfalling Atlantic hurricane uh, in the satellite era, and the strongest since 1935. I think the team did a fantastic job. You know, that was an extremely difficult storm to cover. Florida is very lucky because at one point the NHC, I believe, was forecasting a 145 miles per hour landfall. I think as a team that we did a tremendous job covering Dorian, probably some of the best stuff that we've ever produced, hopefully some of the most helpful stuff indeed. But I think the community aspect is great and how people can send in questions at any time and we can give you the answers live on the air. Isn't that just the most useful thing to do with your time when presenting these shows? Because if you're not reaching out to the audience and um, seeing to their needs, in this case questions, then uh, what's the point of doing this at all? Um, so I think we did an excellent job and I hope that those in the Bahamas can recover to the fullest extent as soon as possible, although that is just not going to be very easy at all. <laughs>